Okay. So, first lesson on mechanics. Um, there's quite a lot of information on this, this um, thing that I've got here, and I've given this to you printed really just so you've got this to refer to over time and to start thinking about how much of the course that we've done. The reason I like to put this all on one page is because it shows you that actually mechanics isn't a very big topic. If I was going to try and put pure maths all on one page, it would be quite overwhelming how much stuff there was for you to learn. I'm going to start talking through this. I'm going to talk through it this section, then I'm going to talk through this section and then talk about this sort of bridging thing that I've got in between. So, and by the way, I'm not expecting you to understand everything on this page. I'm just giving this to you as a preview so that you get a sense of what we'll be doing over the next few months, okay? Mechanics introduction. Mechanics, broadly speaking, concerns motion, so how things move, forces, and how the two interrelate. And I know you looked at some of these things in GCSE with physics. This chapter just gives you an overview of what you'll be covering in year one and how it all links together. In fact, it also links to some of the ideas of things um, in year two as well. There's nothing really that different in year two. It's just the same things made a little bit harder. So we're going to start off looking at forces um, on this whole page, but we're actually going to begin on this side of the page in our next lesson. But I want to, this makes sense to begin talking about forces. It says that you will later encounter force diagrams. This is an example of a force diagram that I've got here. This considers the forces acting at a particular point. Some forces that you might consider, well, here I've got a particular object and it looks like it's being pulled along a table by a piece of string. So inside the string, at this angle, there would be a tension force. Because it's being pulled along a table and the table perhaps isn't smooth, it's a rough table, there would be some friction which is resisting the motion, which is why the arrow here is going in the opposite direction into the way that we think it's going to move. There would be on this object, the weight of it would be pulling it downwards, always vertically downwards. And that's a result of what the force of gravity that will be making things go downwards. There's also, though, this force that we've got here, which is called the reaction force. And that's the thing that prevents the object sinking into the table. And we'll talk about that a lot more when we get to the forces topic. And it says here, this is where vectors is such an important thing. Forces can be considered as vectors because they have directions. The magnitude of the force vector gives us the size of the force. So now you can see why it makes sense that we've found magnitudes of vectors in pure maths, because we're going to be using it a lot in, in uh, mechanics. And we often, con often consider the forces in particular directions. So if the object above is stationary, then forces left would be equal to forces right, and forces up would be equal forces down. Um, and that's what we call Newton's first law, that the forces would be equal to each other if it was stationary and not moving. But often, we need to consider the forces at multiple different points if objects are connected. So, for example, with a pulley. This um, diagram here is something we'll look at much, much later on. But this circle that we have at the top is like a, a pulley. Some people don't know what a pulley is, but it's like a wheel that you can put a piece of string over and the wheel rotates. So there's two masses maybe like a kilogram on this side and, or four kilograms on this side and three kilograms on this side. And they're going to rotate so that one will fall down and other, the other one will fall up because that piece of string is around the pulley. So we're eventually going to look at scenarios that look a bit like this, where there's more than one thing moving. There's also, which is going to be the first area of mechanics that we look at, the study of motion. And actually, there's some nice things that you've done at GCSE that's going to tie into this as well. It says at GCSE you may have encountered displacement time and velocity time graphs. So this is an example of a displacement time graph where you should remember that the gradient gives the velocity. But again, we'll be talking about this in, in much more detail. And we're going to spend a lot of time looking at velocity time graphs where the gradient gives the acceleration and the area under the graph gives the distance. This is all going to be linking together with what you've been doing with Mr. Udin and differentiation because the gradient of a line has a meaning in mechanics. The gradient of the line either means the velocity or the acceleration. So this topic that we look at here is to do with constant acceleration, when things are moving with constant acceleration. And there is a particular set of formulae, which are called SUVAT formulae, that we will use to study how things are moving, which is why it's under this motion title that I've got here. And we're going to look at these different um, areas of things that we might study and some different formulae that we might put together. And that's for things that are constantly accelerating. 
the last bit that we've got down here is when acceleration is not constant and it would be the displacement or the velocity or acceleration as a function of time. This is where you can use differentiation and integration, which we haven't studied yet, um, to change between them. So the stuff you've been doing with Mr. Odin on differentiation will also come into mechanics. Um, the thing that I've said that connects this whole area of this side here of forces with motion is Newton's second law, which I'm sure you've seen in physics at GCSE, F equals MA, where we can look at how a force, a resultant force, interacts with a mass and makes it accelerate. That's what's going to bridge together these two topics of forces and motion, is this, this really um, amazing formula that will connect those together. This is not something I'm expecting you to know at this stage. I just want you to realize all we're going to be looking at is forces, how things are moving, and then bridging them together with forces equaling mass times acceleration. So without further ado, we're going to actually do some um, an introduction to the bits of mechanics we're going to do. And we're going to begin by looking at where we just left off with um, pure maths, which is going to be with some stuff to do with forces. But uh, not forces, vectors. Um, Actually, no, before we do that, sorry, I should have actually mentioned a couple of these things. When we talk about uh, things in mechanics, we often get lots of written information at the beginning that talks about a model. And this is perhaps the best time to talk about these modelling assumptions. We may talk about them again when we do forces, um, but these are some things I wanted you to have printed on a piece of paper so you can refer back to them when you're looking at questions. So for modelling assumptions, it says, as with many areas of applied maths, we often have to make various modelling assumptions to make the maths cleaner or to use well-known mathematical approaches. We've already talked about modelling earlier when we said about quadratic modelling and linear modelling. Here are common modelling assumptions often made in mechanics. Now, I'm not expecting you to have all of these memorised like, immediately, but it's probably worth keeping this document with you when we are doing mechanics because it's always going to be useful to refer back to. And I just want to introduce you to the words now I will be explaining them again in due time as well. So you may see in mechanics questions the word particle. It's not talking about a, like a particle that you would have in chemistry. It's actually just saying that the dimensions of the object are negligible. Negligible means uh, so small that you can ignore them. It means that negligible means it's, it's not even really worth noticing. What this means is that the mass of an object is concentrated at a single point. It's as though it's just a dot. And in practice, this means that rotational forces or air resistance can be ignored. So if you were going to model, say, a rugby ball as a particle, when you throw a rugby ball, if you've ever seen a rugby match, they will spin the rugby ball and it will curve when it, when it flies. If you model it as a particle, it's not possible for it to rotate. So we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be taking the spin of the ball into account, for example. We talked about this a little bit just before. They might say things in a question like a rough or a smooth surface. What this means is that objects in contact with the surface do or do not experience friction. Obviously, the rough ones has friction. The smooth ones don't have any friction at all. Um, if it talks about a pulley, if it says a smooth or a light pulley, that means that there is no friction because it's smooth. And it means that the tension is the same in the string either side of the pulley. I'm exposing this to you now so that if any of you have got a good memory, when we come across this topic, you might be like, oh, yeah, I remember Mr. Bison mentioned that. The fact that it is light means that the pulley has no mass. The inextensible string, it might explain in the question that two particles are connected by an inextensible string. What do we think the word inextensible means? What does it sound like it means? Like it sounds like it doesn't stretch. It just means that it doesn't stretch. A bit like the lanyards you're wearing around your neck. They're not made of elastic that are like really springy and stretchy. And what this means, it says the string does not stretch under a load. And it means that the acceleration is the same in any connected objects. If this object here is going to accelerate downwards, this one here is going to accelerate upwards and at exactly the same rate because the string is not stretchy. Again, we will come across all of these in much more detail. This topic that we've got down here, we probably won't even come across until year 13, but I want to mention some of these words here. It says rod, and a rod is a one dimension, sorry, one dimension is negligible, like a pole or a beam. So it means that it's just, it's just literally like a thin rod of something, and it only needs its length. It means that the mass is concentrated along a line, and it is rigid, 
rigid, meaning that it doesn't bend. Last bit we've got down here, a peg or a support. This might be like a pole and it's resting on these two pegs or these supports. And it says a support from which a body can be suspended or rested. When it's talking about a body here, it's talking about like a pole or something that's a bit bigger than a particle. What it means is that it is dimensionless and fixed. It can be rough or smooth depending on the question. So we're starting to see that these situations can become quite complicated as we go. Um, just keep this with you, keep this booklet as something to refer to. There's far too much information in here now for you to really process all of it, but it's definitely gonna be worth having. And what I've put on this next page is something that when you're answering questions and it talks about a modeling assumption, this might be something that is helpful for you to have. I took this from the textbook um, and these are some interesting things. That if the question says to you, how have you, what have you done by taking into account the fact that the string is inextensible, you could say the acceleration is the same in objects connected by a taut inextensible string. It doesn't need to be perfectly said like that. The main thing is, for example, the acceleration is the same. So as part of your homework, I'm just going to ask you to read through this to start exposing yourself to it. You're not going to have these memorized, but if you have it with you, you'll be able to start using it when we do those forces topics in a few weeks time. Okay. I know it feels like there's quite a lot of information there. Um, it's just stuff from the textbook so that you've got it in your notes and you'll be able to use that later on. Okay, we're now actually gonna sort of be moving on to proper doing some uh, mechanics for today's lesson. We've still got a, a bit of time to get these completed. So we're gonna just talk about the units that you would use in mechanics, still as part of this introduction here. They call these SI units, and the reason that they're called SI units is because they are from um, a French organization who created this standard system of how things should be measured. I don't know if you saw in the news recently, but they were like changing this metal kilogram in France, in Paris. They were like changing the size of a kilogram by like 0 .0 0 0 0 0 0.000000 grams or something. So it's quite like a serious deal in France that they, they measure what the standard ways we should measure things. So SI units are a standard system of units used internationally, and these are the ones that you must use in questions. So when we're talking about mass, you must use kilograms. You cannot use grams. If you get given something in grams, you have to convert it to kilograms. Length or displacement, anything will always be in meters, not centimeters. Time will always be in seconds, not hours or minutes. Speed and velocity will always be in meters per second. And you'll see here that when we do meters per second, we write meters s to the minus one. Because to the minus one means over s, so it's meters per second. For acceleration, it is meters per second per second. Now, it's going to sound really silly for me to explain this, because some of you probably are just like, yeah, I know what that means. But the acceleration is how the speed is changing every second, hence it being the speed changing every second. So if something's accelerating at five meters per second per second, that means every second it is getting five meters per second quicker. So it would be going like 25 meters per second, 30 meters per second, 35 meters per second as the speeds. Some, some people just find that really, really confusing. And that one is ms to the minus two. Last of all, force or weight we would say is uh, Newton's, and we just use the capital letter N for that. Sometimes that could be also written as kilogram meters per second squared, because force equals mass times acceleration. But you will rarely see it written as kilogram meters per second squared. You will just see that force is in Newton's. OK. Now let's do some maths that links back to what we were just doing in our vectors topic. We're going to just remind ourselves of these conversions between vectors and scalars. Um, so this is basically what we just talked about 20 minutes ago. In mechanics, you will often need to convert to or from the scalar form of a quantity and the vector form. So I've got an example here. A scalar quantity has magnitude, i.e. size only. The five meters is a distance. The value is always positive. So the distance between A and B is 5 metres. A vector quantity also has direction. The vector equivalent of distance is displacement. So this one is 3 across and 4 up. And notice that to go 3 across and 4 up, 
you're drawing out a vector triangle that still makes the vector law of triangle addition true. So distance, we've just said, it's vector form, is displacement. So fill this in to your table that the distance uh, vector form of distance is displacement. And underneath that, the vector form of speed, or I've done that a lot in the last lesson, is velocity. You need to get very familiar with these words. And it's pretty easy to remember which one is which, because speed is scalar, s and s, and velocity is vector, because they both begin with a v. I mean, it's, it's pretty simple to remember those ones. There are other quantities which can be vectors or scalars. You can have a force, and if it has a direction with it, then it's going to be a vector. If it's just the size, it's just a scalar. Acceleration can also accelerate in different directions. Some things cannot be vectors. Time cannot be a vector, because it only moves in one direction. And mass also cannot be a vector. How could a mass have a direction? Um, there's a note down here at the bottom. It says, one-dimensional vectors are still different from scalars. Consider the displacement on a one-dimensional line in a, peculiar di in a particular direction if we'd gone backwards three units. So if we said that this was the start and this was the finish, but actually we are measuring to the right as the positive direction, this vector quantity, this displacement as we go backwards, is going to be different to the distance. The distance between the start and the finish is three metres. But the displacement, because we're going in the negative direction, the displacement would be minus three meters. So that is actually a vector quantity. Even though we won't write it like a column vector, it is still a vector quantity, but just in one dimension. When I talk about one dimension in maths, one dimension is just things moving left and right. Obviously, two dimensions is moving up and down and left and right like that as well. So you can have vector quantities that are one dimensional and it will either be saying to the right is positive and to the left is negative or vice versa. OK, I know there's lots of listening from me here, but it's just the intro lesson. So we're going to just do six examples together and then you're going to do some practice for me. We want to see if we can do some, uh, some conversions from scalar form to vector form. We have been told that to go from A to B is 5 metres on an angle of 60 degrees, and we want to turn this into a vector. It says in my notes, to convert to vector form, just use basic trigonometry to find the x change and the y change. So I'm going to look at the speed tip afterwards, but if I was going to try and find out the x change that I have over here, if I do a quick triangle and I've got x, 5, and 60, what would I use, um, what trigonometry could I use there for, from Sokotoa? The cosine one. So I could say that the cosine of 60 is the adjacent over the hypotenuse, x over 5. So x is equal to what? 5 cos 60. y would be equal to, what do you think y would be equal to? Pardon? Not using Pythagoras, not tan either. If we were going to think about y, if we have y and 5 and 60, what connects the y, the 5 and the 60? So, cat or toa? So we would get that the sine of 60 is y over 5. So y is equal to 5 sine 60. So in that vector form, we have 5 cos 60, 5 sine 60, and the arrow is going in that direction. So the 5 cos 60, is that going to the right or to the left? Right. And the 5 sine 60? It's going up. OK. The way that we can tell which one is going to be cos and which one is going to be sine is that the cos one is adjacent to the angle. Why should you be thinking, oh, yeah, obviously? Why would you think, oh, obviously, cos have to go with the adjacent? Because, cos is adjacent. because the cos is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. And the sine goes opposite the angle. 
because sine is opposite over the hypotenuse. Now, the tip that I've written makes sense. Speed tip. If x is the magnitude, you could use x cos theta for the side adjacent to the angle and x sine theta for the side opposite to it. No, I think that's a real alarm. <laughs> Absolutely.